What's going on, everyone? I'm your host, JT. Back to you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. On this episode, we're going to be discussing will Sean Payton and Frank Wright have success as the new head coaches for their respective organizations? But before we dive into those two NFL topics, we got to talk some college football since it's been a while. A couple of days ago, news came out that former Notre Dame offensive coordinator Tommy Reese was going to be leaving his alma mater to become the new offensive coordinator of Alabama. Now, when I first saw this news, I thought that this was a home run hire for Alabama because I have always felt like Tommy Reese has been one of the better offensive coordinators in college football. So I was really, really taken back when I logged into the Twitter app on my phone and I saw a lot of Notre Dame fans celebrating Tommy Reese leaving Notre Dame for Alabama, not for the reasons that you think. Normally, when you see fans talking about a coordinator who they really like leaving their program, they normally say, oh, I'm going to miss this guy. This is going to be a big loss. It's going to be hard to replace this man. I appreciate what he did for this program. But instead, there were Notre Dame fans celebrating, saying, thank you, Nick Saban, for freeing us of the dreadful play calling of Tommy Reese. And there were even some Notre Dame fans out there who said that Tommy Reese underachieved. That's the OC for the Fighting Irish. And I was just like, underachieved? What do you mean underachieved? You make it seem like Notre Dame is bringing in the kind of offensive talent from recruiting that Alabama, Clemson, and Georgia are. And I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to act like I'm a Notre Dame fan because I'm not. And I'm not going to lie and say that I've watched every single down of Notre Dame football. But I have watched a good amount of Notre Dame football over the last couple of years. I have to say that I at least watch five or six Notre Dame games a year. And the times that I've watched Notre Dame and their offense with Tommy Reese as the OC, I've never really had any moment when I said, oh, Tommy Reese is a terrible OC. But the way that Notre Dame fans talk about this dude, they make it seem like he's probably one of the worst OCs in program history. I go through Tommy Reed's resume, right? I want to see just this terrible play calling. I, I want to see it shown because if he's a bad OC, it's going to be shown somewhere on the stat sheet. What did he do last season, 2022? Notre Dame was 33rd in points per game. 52nd in yards per game. Yeah, your passing attack was awful. But was that really all because of Tommy Reese? Or was that because you had Drew Pine, that quarterback? 2021. Notre Dame was 18th in points per game. 42nd in yards per game. 19th in pass yards per game. 79th in rushing yards per game. But that was supposed to be a rebuilding year for Notre Dame that season. And yet... Their offense was still really freaking good with Jack Cohn at quarterback. Can any of you Notre Dame fans tell me right now where Jack Cohn is? If you said the XFL, you got it right. And no, that's not a joke. Jack Cohn really is at this moment on the XFL roster. 2020, Tommy Reese, first season as the play caller for Notre Dame, The quarterback he gets is Ian Book. Now, Ian Book is probably the best quarterback that Tommy Reese has ever had during his time calling plays for the Fighting Irish. Ian Book, I think, is probably one of the better or one of the best quarterbacks in Notre Dame program history. And yet, Tommy Reese takes Ian Book and he elevates him. Ian Book had a fantastic season. Year one under Tommy Reese, his first season calling plays for the Irish. They were 27th in points per game, 23rd in yards per game. They were pretty balanced when it came to what they were able to do, throwing and running the football. And it's like Notre Dame fans just make it seem like this dude was absolutely garbage. And don't give me the old, oh, JT, you just going off stats. You got to watch the game. I watch these games, fam. And I haven't seen one Notre Dame, one Notre Dame game when I said, oh yeah, Tommy Reese is a terrible offensive coordinator. Is he the best OC in college football? No, he's not. Is he a top five, top 10 OC? Probably not. But I do think that he is an upgrade 
from Bill O'Brien. And Bill O'Brien wasn't that bad. It's just that Bill O'Brien had an offense that was too quarterback dependent. Just like how his offenses when he was the head coach of the Houston Texans became too quarterback dependent when Deshaun Watson became the quarterback that we view him today. I think that Tommy Reese is going to be perfectly fine. That's the OC for Alabama. You know, the Dane fans can say, oh, JT, he underachieved with the talent that we had here. Okay, but... You don't recruit the same level of talent on the offensive side of the football that Alabama does. Alabama's pretty much bringing in damn near the best players at every position on offense, every single recruiting cycle. They're either bringing in one of the best quarterbacks, one of the top running backs, one of the best wide receivers, one of the best offensive linemen. Like Alabama, most of the time, ends up with the best everything on offense or one of the best everythings on offense. Tommy Reese is going to be going to Tuscaloosa with way more talent to work with than what he ever had at Notre Dame. And I think that some of you guys are kind of selling Tommy Reese a little short. You're not going to give him credit for making things shake with Drew Pine. I don't even think Drew Pine was the starting quarterback going into last season. Who was it? Tyler Buckner? So he ends up making things work. With a backup quarterback. And we saw why Drew Pine was the second string quarterback for Notre Dame this year. Not trying to be disrespectful to him. He most definitely could end up doing some good things down there with Kenny Dillingham at Arizona State. But not only was he not all that accurate when he was playing for Notre Dame last season. But on top of that, the receiving core wasn't all that great either. And when you think of Notre Dame, you really think of two things, offensive linemen and tight end. When has Notre Dame ever been a football factory when it comes to producing elite level talent at wide receiver year in and year out? The best receiver that they have in the NFL or that they put in the league in recent history is Chase Claypool. So I don't really understand how Notre Dame fans are trying to you know, knock Tommy Reese and what he did during his time there. Like, the dude was just dog crap. This dude was a really good coordinator for Notre Dame to the point that Brian Kelly wanted to bring him when he took the LSU job. But Tommy Reese said, nah, man, I'm good where I'm at. I'm good at Notre Dame. I'm good at the school that I played quarterback for. And then Nick Saban comes along. He comes knocking. Hey, man, listen. I think you're a damn good play caller, and I want to run a pro-star offense. Tommy Reese, did you see what Todd Monken in Georgia did this season? People kind of thought that the pro-star offense in college football was dead. Everybody tried to say, to be successful in college football, you need to be running three, four receiver sets. You need to be running a spread offense, no huddle. It has to be fast plays. Everybody needs to be running the Tennessee-style offense or Ohio State-style offense. And then Georgia, Kirby Smart and company, when everybody's like Kirby Smart needs to evolutionize or modernize his offense and go from that pro style to the, to the spread, what does Kirby Smart do? He says, no, 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 I'm going to stick with what I know. I'm going to stick with pro-style football, complementary football, balanced football, being able to throw in pass. And what does Nick Saban want to do? He wants to go back to that. According to the multiple articles I've read, Nick Saban wants to get back to playing that pro-style offense, taking more snaps underneath center from the quarterback, being able to have more success running the football along with being able to have that success throwing the football as well. And when you're able to play that style of football, guess what? Your defense ends up being a little bit better because then they're not on the field for as much time as what they would be if you were to run a spread offense and you're on the field for what, 90, 100 plays if you're the opposing, well, if you're the defense because of how fast those spread offenses are. Nick Saban, I trust him. And you probably should too. And you can say, well, JT, should I really trust Nick Saban? When he whiffed on his previous two coordinator hires, Bill O'Brien was not a bad offensive coordinator for Alabama. 
Now, he definitely wasn't one of the best. As a matter of fact, he probably was the worst offensive coordinator that Nick Saban has had of the last decade. But it wasn't like he was putting out an F-plus performance. I would probably give Bill O'Brien a B-minus for the job that he did calling plays during his time at Alabama. Their defensive coordinator, Pete Golding, hell, he wasn't that great. But he's now the D.C. of Ole Miss. And Bill O'Brien is the offensive coordinator of New England. So guys go to Alabama and walk away with promotions most of the time. The fact that Bill O'Brien and Pete Golding are not head coaches kind of is more of a knock on them. Nick Saban, yeah, he did whiff on them. You know, they weren't bad hires, but they weren't the greatest hires, at least not as good as the ones that you made in the past. So Nick Saban goes out. He interviews a couple of guys. It's not like Tommy Reese was the only interview. He had pretty much anybody who he could have gotten to become the offensive coordinator of this job. And let's not act like Nick Saban is a novice, okay? I'm pretty sure Nick Saban talked to plenty of people in college football circles that are really connected to these coaching staffs, and I'm pretty sure he was recommended some of the best of the best. And also, he coached against Notre Dame. Well, what was that Notre Dame? Yeah, he's coached against Notre Dame in the past. He knows the limitations of that program. He knows that that program isn't bringing in top-level receivers and quarterbacks every year? Nick Saban sees something in Tommy Reese. And Nick Saban hasn't missed on too many coordinator hires. So you may look at Tommy Reese and say, JT, he just has a so-so resume. But if you really look at what he had to work with at Notre Dame compared to what he's going to be working with now at Alabama, it's like going from... You ever went to Walmart... You know, in Walmart, when you go to the cereal aisle, they got two brands of cereal. You got the real cereal, you know, you got your Fruit Loops, and then you got your Walmart brand, Great Value Fruit Loops, right? Being the offensive coordinator at Notre Dame, it was good. You get what I'm saying? It wasn't bad, you know? It was a good time. You had some talent to work with. You always had a really good offensive line. You always had... A pretty good group of running backs. You always were stacked at tight end, but you never really had a lot of dynamic weapons at receiver or even a really great quarterback. I look at Tommy Reese going to Alabama as an upgrade. I don't really see how this is going to fail. And it seems like the perception about this hire lies in three categories. You either feel... Three ways about this high. You're either me, you think that this is going to work because you trust Nick Saban, and you don't think that Tommy Reese was as bad as how Notre Dame fans are trying to make him out to be, or you lie on the other half of the spectrum, you disagree with me. You think that this hire isn't great. It was a so-so hire. It's not a bad hire. I'm pretty sure most of us are going to agree with that. It wasn't a bad hire. But you may look at this as a so-so hire. Some of you may just view this hire as a, a lateral move. You might say, JT, Tommy Reese isn't really all that better than Bill O'Brien. Now, some Bama fans probably will push against you with that sentiment. I probably would too. And I'm not a Bama fan, but I'm just saying. Like, like sheesh. A lot of Notre Dame fans really don't like Tommy Reese. Really don't like Tommy Reese. And then, your last category, you got the people who are on the fence. They're taking the wait and see approach. They're saying, JT, I don't really know. I'm a little conflicted. Yeah, it was Bama and I trust Nick Saban, but it's not like Tommy Reese was doing anything crazy at Notre Dame. And I can understand that. But I really feel like a lot of people are selling Tommy Reese short. Because most people who follow Alabama or speak on Alabama news are mostly casuals. You don't really follow college football from a, you know, deep perspective or a deep viewpoint. And what I mean by that is you don't really keep up with college football heavily like that. You just pay attention to Alabama. You're not really paying attention to really what Tommy Reese did at Notre Dame. And I'm not saying that Tommy Reese was turning, you know, garbage into gold, okay? 
But I do think that it's fair to say that Tommy Reese being considered as one of the worst offensive coordinators at Notre Dame, I think it's kind of a little bit of people just trying to bring the guy down a little bit just because he left Notre Dame for Alabama. If the dude stayed at Notre Dame, I'm pretty sure Notre Dame fans wouldn't be criticizing him as what they are now. And I mean, yeah, you can say, well, JT, we're happy for this guy to leave. So, of course, we could have cared less if the guy left. Okay, yeah. But if you are saying that we're going to do better, I kind of would disagree with that. I think that you most definitely can do a lot worse than Tommy Reese. You want to know why? Because Tommy Reese isn't a bad OC. If you had to give Tommy Reese a letter grade, A through F, what would you give him? I give him a B minus. I think that he is a B minus, B something level coordinator. And when he goes to Alabama, you know what Nick Saban does with these guys. He he brings them in. He puts them into this little coaching program or that. I don't know what he does, but he does something with these coaches. And then after a few years, they become head coach material. So you go to Alabama as a young OC, you're looking to learn from the best. You're looking to improve. You're looking to grow. So even if you do feel like Tommy Reese isn't a good OC, Who's to say that he can't get better under Nick Saban? There are a lot of guys who have improved as coordinators and eventually become good enough to be good head coaches. And most of the guys who have been hired from Nick Saban's coach entry of recent memory have been working out up to this point. Now, we still got to see what's going to happen with Sark and whatnot, but Mike Loxley is doing perfectly fine with Maryland. He has them on the up and up. Brian Dable is the head coach of the New York Giants. Lane Kiffin is doing a pretty fine job at Ole Miss. I just don't understand how so many people are, you know, just so negative about this hire. Like, even if you don't trust Tommy Reese, you don't trust Nick Saban? Like, I understand that Georgia just won their second consecutive national championship, but damn! We just counting on Alabama like that? Two years gone, and Georgia's the top dog. Kirby Smart is the best coach in college football. And Nick Saban doesn't know how to make staff hires. The narrative about Alabama and Nick Saban has just changed that quickly to the point that we don't have no trust, no faith, no confidence. And Nick Saban, who still is the best coach in college football, until I see somebody who has the same amount as national championships as Nick Saban, I'm still going to regard him as the best coach in this game. And I'm still going to trust his judgment when it comes to these coaching hires. There are plenty of OCs who he could have hired to take this job. There are guys who you probably feel are better play callers than Tommy Reese, who Nick Saban could have hired to take this job. I think that Tommy Reese is going to work out as the offensive coordinator for Alabama. So Sean Payton, as we already know, is the new head coach of the Denver Broncos. They paid this guy a lot of money to take this head coaching job. And I had a friend of mine who said, you know, JT, I don't really think that Sean Payton is going to work. First of all, the Denver Broncos, they already didn't have a lot of draft capital. So they gave up the few remaining key draft capital that they had to acquire Sean Payton. So you can't really improve your roster through the draft. I was like, okay, I hear you. That's understood. And then he said, he has to fix Russell Wilson also, JT. Like, I don't think he's going to be able to do that. And that's where I I hit that big red button and I say, just stop. J just stop real quick. Russell Wilson, yes, he was bad last season. But... Was he bad all oh, just because he fell off? He just hit the cliff? He's regressing? Or was he bad because he not only is an aging player that's regressing, but also he had a terrible head coach? Nathaniel Hackett. We can't overlook the fact that Nathaniel Hackett was the guy calling the plays for the first couple of weeks into Denver season, and then he gave up play calling duties. He said, nope, I'm not good at this. I'm going to give it to somebody else. And yeah, we just want to put 
all the blame on Russell Wilson. Like, we we can't see the fact that, you know, sometimes when you have a bad head coach, he just completely brings down the whole entire team. You're going to have Sean Payton. So there's no way this offense can be any worse than what it was last year under Nathaniel Hackett. You have an experienced head coach. You don't have a head coach who's learning on the job. Not only that, but you have one of the greatest offensive minds in the history of this game. And listen, the Denver Broncos made an all-time mistake when they paid Russell Wilson that contract or when they gave him the amount of money that they did with that new deal. So when you have an all-time mistake, it's going to take an all-time great head coach to fix it. Hence why you pay Sean Payton all that money to entice him more and more to take this job. And you know that Sean Payton, he's going to assemble a really good coaching staff. And it's not like the Denver Broncos don't still have one of the more talented rosters in the NFL. Like before last season kicked off, we seem to forget that many people view the Denver Broncos as a sure end to at least make it to the divisional round. I mean, that receiver, they're still stacked. Tim Patrick, he didn't even play. The dude got a season cut short. So he's going to be coming back. You pair him up with Jerry Judy, then Cortland Sutton. You still should have a a decent offensive line. You're going to have Javante Williams coming back. You're telling me Sean Payton? And Russell Wilson can't make something cook with this kind of talent on offense? Then on defense, they had a top five defense last season. And that's with their offense going through and out, drive after drive after drive. You look at how Russell Wilson played once Nathaniel Hackett was fired. He played better. Against the LA Chargers, Russell Wilson made some vintage Russell Wilson throws. And there were a lot of throws that made me go, hmm... I didn't really see a lot of this when Nathaniel Hackett was the head coach. So imagine what Russell Wilson could do with Sean Payton. And do you guys remember what Sean Payton did his final season with the Saints? He went 9-8, which may not be all that impressive when you look at it on paper. But when you look at the context of that 9-8 season, he had several different quarterbacks. He had Jameis Winston as his damn starting quarterback going into the 2021 NFL season. And at one point, it was working. Jameis Winston and Sean Payton, at one point, they were on top of the NFC South at 5-1. and one. They're playing the Tim Bay Buccaneers. And then Jameis Winston ends up taking a nasty hit by Devin White. His season gets ended at that moment. And then after that, the Saints season, you think, would have been over. But nah, the Saints still found a way to stay in the playoff hunt with Trevor Simeon, Ian Book, and Taysom Hill all starting at quarterback some point during the season. Not to mention New Orleans had probably one of, if not the worst receiving core out of any team that had a winning record. Their best receiver that year was Marquez Callaway. Can you tell me what Marquez Callaway did this past season for the New Orleans Saints? Not, not too much of anything. So if Sean Payton can turn Jameis Winston into what he did his final season in New Orleans, I'm pretty confident that he can make Russell Wilson serviceable. And even if you're a Broncos fan, I'm pretty sure you're not expecting a Super Bowl. You're just hoping that Sean Payton can get Russell Wilson playing at a good enough level that you can at least make it to the playoffs. And you have a very good chance at doing that. Look at your division. We just quick to give it to the Chargers and the Chiefs and that like the Broncos aren't going to have a chance to compete for that second spot in the division. Like, bro, Brandon Staley, he yes, he hired a new offensive coordinator in Kellen Moore, who is an upgrade from the previous OC that he had. But let's not act like the offense was the main problem. The main problem was that doggone defense. Brandon Staley. I got to lick my lips real quick. Brandon Staley is a defensive-minded coach. But yet the Chargers defense 
still hasn't looked like an elite defense under him. And I'm still waiting. You can say, well, JT, we dealt with injuries. Okay, but even when you went into that Dolphins game with multiple starters out, you were able to slow down their offense. So it's like you had injuries in that game. So if you can slow down that offense in that game with those injuries, why couldn't you do it for the other games that you had multiple guys out in? And even when the Chargers were fully healthy on defense, their defense still wasn't good. This was the same defense that allowed the Jaguars to come back after halftime when they were up so many possessions. But we just want to act like the Broncos are going to come into this division and they're going to be competing for third or fourth place with the Las Vegas Raiders? Come on now. We have to show some more respect to Sean Payton. Let's stop acting like Sean Payton isn't one of the greatest offensive minds in the history of the sport. Let's not acting like Sean Payton isn't a better coach than Brandon Staley and Josh McDaniels. The Denver Broncos in this division with Sean Payton right now should at least be in the conversation for being in second place. I mean, people are really asking, how is Sean Payton and the Broncos and Russell Wilson going to find a way to compete with Justin Herbert and the LA Chargers? People make it all about the quarterback, but nobody really pays attention to the whole entire team. We making this all about Russell Wilson, fixing Russell Wilson, fixing Russell Wilson. I under, we all know how important the quarterback position is. But no team has just won a Super Bowl because of one guy. It's 10 other guys on that field too. The Broncos got a really good team. The LA Chargers, even when they are fully healthy, Brendan Staley in big moments, he makes... A lot of head-scratching decisions, being too overly aggressive on fourth down, not being great at managing the clock. Like, bro, I understand Justin Herbert is an all-world talent at quarterback, and the Chargers have a fantastic roster when healthy. But I don't really think the problem is the roster, or even their OC. I think the problem is just the dude who they got as their head coach. So I expect... The Denver Broncos, regardless of what they do this offseason, free agency, the draft, I'm telling you right now, I think that the Denver Broncos, as of, what what's the date? February 5th, 2023, are at least going to finish in second place in the AFC West come next season. And you can record this, screenshot it, do whatever you got to do. Just remember that I told you, that the Denver Broncos are going to at least be in second place in the AFC West come the start of the 2023 NFL season. We got to have more faith in great coaching. Okay, Denver Broncos fans, you're paying Sean Payton a lot of money. And when you listen to Sean Payton and any of the interviews that he does, I just saw a recent one that he did inside of the Broncos facility. He said, listen, I'm excited for this opportunity. But he also reiterated several times that This is going to be a challenge. This isn't going to be easy. And even if the whole Russell Wilson thing is too much for Sean Payton to fix up, I still can't really see the Broncos just being a terrible team. I can't see the Broncos winning no less than seven games as Sean Payton as the head coach, regardless of how bad Russell Wilson plays. Think about how many games the Broncos could have won last season if Nathaniel Hackett was just a tad bit better as a head coach. Sean Payton, I think, is going to succeed with the Denver Broncos. Russell Wilson, yes, he was bad last season, but I think that Sean Payton, with how great of an offensive mind he is and his track record of being able to elevate quarterbacks, like we saw with Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill, I'm pretty sure... He'll have no problem being able to get Russell Wilson playing at a serviceable level. Are you going to see Russell Wilson return to being a MVP candidate or a top five or top 10 can top 10 quarterback? Probably not. But if you're telling me that Sean Payton, this same head coach who with his gifted hands turned Mr. 30 for 30 to the NFL's best touchdown or interception ratio leader. And Jameis Winston, I'm pretty sure he can do the same thing with Russell Wilson. I'm pretty sure that Sean Payton can do God's work 
with Russell Wilson and make this contract somewhat bearable to deal with. I'm pretty sure Broncos fans are, aren't are going to be happy if Russell Wilson can't return to that top 10, top 5 level because that's what you expected when you gave him that contract. But if you can at least get Russell Wilson playing at a, you know, 17th or 16th ranked quarterback level, I think that's kind of a win at this point of his career. Now, if he ends up exceeding that and he just bounces back, then kudos to Sean Payton for pulling off one of the greatest fixes that we've ever seen from a head coach. I think that Sean Payton is going to work with the Denver Broncos. The staff is going to be good. You're going to have a good amount of talent, no matter who you lose in free agency or whatnot. Yeah, you may lose a couple of guys or two, but... I still think for the most part, the Broncos roster going into next season should probably be a top 14, top 12-ish roster. And with Sean Payton, I think that this team should be able to make it to the postseason. Who says that this offense is going to run through Russell Wilson? For all we know, this offense could run through the run game. And they just find ways to... Get Russell Wilson involved when they need to. Sean Payton is a fantastic coach. He's not going to make the Broncos quarterback-centric, all right? If you're thinking that Russell Wilson has to be able to outplay Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert, I think you're just overthinking it a little bit too much. Yes, having great quarterback play matters, but there has also been teams who have won their divisions with Average to barely above average quarterback play. Look at the 49ers. The 49ers just won the NFC West starting Trey Lance, Jimmy Garoppolo, and Brock Purdy. You don't need fantastic quarterback play to win in this league. All Denver needs is for Russell Wilson to be serviceable, and that can happen. We talk about how much success will Sean Payton have with the Denver Broncos, but will Frank Wright succeed as the new head coach of the Carolina Panthers? Got a good friend of mine who also has a podcast called The Juice Alert. Check him out. His name is Jamal McKinney, and he hit me up. I forgot what time it was. It was really early in the morning, and he said, yo, JT, I don't know how you feel about the Frank Wright hiring, but I don't think it's going to work. And I was like, really? You don't think it's going to work? Why? He was like, Well, JT, he underachieved in Indianapolis. And I said, explain to me how he underachieved in Indianapolis. Well, he was like, after Andrew Luck retired, didn't really do too much. He went 7-9 with Jacoby Brissett. 2020, he did a little something with Phillip Rivers. And then after that, it wasn't really anything impressive to write home about. They folded late in the season in 2021, missing out of the playoffs. And it was largely due to Carson Wentz not being able to take care of the football. And in his final season last year, he didn't even make it through. He got fired with the 3-5-1 record. And when he said those things, I was like, you know, you're making some really good points. But there were a lot of, there's a lot of context that he left out. You know, let's talk about the fact that the reason why he failed in Indianapolis wasn't because he was a bad coach. As a matter of fact, during his time in Indianapolis, most people had him as a top 12 coach in his league. One thing about Frank Reich that people don't really talk about is how great of a staff this guy is always able to put together. Remember, Matt Eberflus was his defensive coordinator. He's a head coach. And you can determine how good a head coach is by how many opportunities the guys under him are awarded. If you have a head coach who is constantly having guys on his staff who are getting interviews for head coaching jobs, that tells you that that head coach has a really good eye for spotting good coordinators. He has a really good eye for building a staff. And the Carolina Panthers at the time, I'm recording this literally right now, news has come out that they have just hired the former defensive coordinator, of the Denver Broncos. Now, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. I just call him Coach E. But this dude was a fantastic defensive coordinator for Denver last season. As a matter of fact, he was probably the only good thing about watching the Denver Broncos. He was the only reason the Denver Broncos were probably even watchable at times. That defense was fantastic. And imagine 
just how good that defense could have been if they had an offense that was able to give them a little bit more time to rest on the sidelines. But instead, the offense kept going through and out, and every time the defense got to stop, 30 seconds later, it's like, oh, sheesh. Where, where's my helmet? We, we, we back on the field again? You get him. I know that you're probably going to have a really good OC, even though Frank Wright may probably be the primary call, the primary play caller. You have retained your special teams and your offensive line coach. The coaching staff for Carolina is going to be fantastic. And if you have a great coaching staff, more times than not, your team is going to perform at a really high level. We all make it about the players, but we also forget about the things that we overlook. And one of the things that we overlook are the coaching staffs. And we don't really talk about anybody on the coaching staffs unless it's somebody who isn't good at calling the plays. That's the only time we really pay attention to it. Most of the times when you have a great defensive coordinator or a great offensive coordinator, most of the casual fans don't even talk about them. Frank Wright also is really good with quarterbacks, okay? He won the Super Bowl with Nick Foles when he was the OC for the Philadelphia Eagles. And when Andrew Luck retired, Jacoby Brissett, he didn't play bad. He was pretty solid that season. Then in 2020, you get Phillip Rivers. He was pretty good under Frank Reich as well. Carson Wentz. You can say Carson Wentz didn't work out in Indianapolis, but you can't ignore the fact that he had the second most efficient season of his whole entire NFL career under Frank Wright and then look at what happened to Carson Wentz once he got traded away from Indianapolis the dude pretty much fell apart in Washington Frank Wright is a really good offensive mind and he's really good with quarterbacks and as long as he can find stability at the quarterback position in Carolina this is going to work You see who he just hired as his defensive coordinator. And this defense is super talented. You have a good group of cornerbacks, even though you need some more depth behind J.C. Horn and Dante Jackson. Okay, because C.J. Henderson, that's your third cornerback. I don't know. He was a little bit up and down this season. Then you got Brian Burns, one of the best young pass rushers in the league. The Carolina Panthers have Jeremy Chen, one of, if not the most underrated safety in the NFL. There's tons of talent on this defense, and there's a good amount of talent on this offense. This offensive line was okay, especially when it came to opening up holes in the run game. This is probably one of the best run-blocking offensive lines in the NFL. You got DJ Moore at receiver. You got Terrence Marshall, who has shown some glimpses at times. Frank Reich, as long as he can get the quarterback situation taken care of, he's going to work. And the most important reason why I think he's going to have more success in Carolina than what he did in Indianapolis is that Jim Mersey, we all know that he's notoriously known for meddling. He's somebody who doesn't know how to let the chef cook. He's somebody that, you know, he tells you to go make something And then every five minutes, he's coming back telling you, no, do this, do that, do this, do that. He doesn't know how to let the guys he pays to do their jobs to do their jobs. Just look at what's going on with his current head coaching search. I find it really, really ironic that some of the top head coaching candidates have declined to interview for this coach job. And not only that, but look who is still being brought up as a finalist to win this head coaching opportunity, Jeff freaking Saturday. That should tell you everything you need to know about Jim Mersey that he still is viewing Jeff Saturday as a legitimate head coaching candidate for this job. And if Jeff Saturday works out and he ends up getting the job, cool. I'll I'll end up being okay, being wrong about that. But the fact that he's going to a franchise now that may not, force him to do things that he may not want to do, unlike during his time in Indianapolis with Jim Irsay. You guys already know this. If you're a Colts fan, don't try to deny this. There's been plenty of stories and people who have already came out and said that Jim Irsay kind of is a little bit hard to work with. All right? So you're going to Carolina, David Temper. I'm pretty sure David Temper is going to allow him 
the work. He's going to allow him to do his job. He's not going to meddle in too many things. There are a lot of routes that the Carolina Panthers can take at quarterback, even though I am against the idea of Frank Reich and company bringing in a veteran quarterback because that's what got him in trouble last time. Bringing in veteran quarterbacks, not bringing in no no young blood. Bring in some young blood. If the Carolina Panthers can draft a quarterback and hit on them, they're going to be perfectly fine. That's the problem. When Carolina got rid of Cam Newton, they never replaced him. Carolina is still looking for Cam Newton's replacement years after they got rid of him. Frank Wright, with how good he is at working with quarterbacks and getting the most efficient play out of quarterbacks, I would trust him with the Will Levis or Anthony Richardson or whoever they decide to draft that quarterback. Hell, if they don't want to draft a quarterback and they want to go the free agency route, they want to bring in the Jimmy G or Derek Carr, I would be opposed to that. But I would have faith that it would work because none of those guys are like super old, not like a Phillip Rivers old. I'm pretty sure Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, they're going to play more than one or two years if they go to Carolina. But if you don't go the veteran QB route, let's say you want to start Matt Corral. I think that could work. Like, I just think that Frank Wright is really good when it comes to the offensive side of the football. And that's what Carolina needs. You look at the head coaches who are having the most success in the league right now. They're all offensive-minded coaches. Look at the four teams that we had in the conference championship game. We had Cincinnati, Kansas City. Both of those two teams had offensive-minded coaches. Eagles, 49ers, NFC Championship game, same thing. Both two offensive-minded coaches. The Carolina Panthers, you're in a division that right now is up for grabs. I mean, the Saints, you don't really know what's going to happen with them. Yeah, they have a way talented roster, but you don't really know how good of a coach Dennis Allen is. The Tempe Buccaneers right now, they're, they're not in a really good spot. You saw what just happened last year, their final season with Tom Brady. It was embarrassing, to say the least. And then you have the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, I don't really know which direction the Falcons are going to go, but from looking at how Desmond Ritter played the last couple games of the season, you don't really know if they got anything at quarterback. So you don't really know what this division is going to look like. There's a lot of uncertainty from the three other teams in this division. And for Frank Reich in Carolina, there is a prime opportunity for them to come right away, make it to the postseason, and grab this division by the throat. Will Frank Reich succeed as the head coach of the Carolina Panthers? I think that he will. Now, I don't know if they're going to make it to the playoffs year one or whatnot with them, but I do think over the next two, three years, Frank Reich could end up building Carolina into a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Frank Wright, this isn't one of those coaching hires that's like a Doug Peterson where you have a former coach who has won a Super Bowl like him or Mike McCarthy and they're trying to go to a new team to rebuild themselves and just get a fresh start. He's This isn't one of those head coaching hires, but this is a head coaching hire where you have a guy who's getting a second opportunity where his previous spot, He wasn't all that bad. I mean, prior to Frank Reich's final season with the Colts, he only had one losing season, which came after Andrew Luck retired right before the season. And it went 7-9. I think that Frank Reich is going to be really successful as the new head coach for the Carolina Panthers. Weak division. You also have the fact that he is the best offensive mind in that division. I mean, you can say, well, JT, you think he's better than Arthur Smith? Yes. I think Frank Reich is better than Arthur Smith because unlike Arthur Smith, Frank Reich has showed that he has a really good track record with quarterbacks. The other two head coaches in this division, they're both defensive minded. I think Frank Reich is going to succeed as the head coach of the Carolina Panthers. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you haven't already, make sure that you go ahead, leave a like, and subscribe to the channel. We upload NFL videos and college football content 
daily. Make sure that you listen to the JT Sports Podcast, available on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts from, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon. You can find the JT Sports Podcast, and I will see you guys shortly with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.